thank you, Danny, for your continued service. <clears throat> Those who expect to reap the blessings of freedom must undergo the fatigues of supporting it. You, you didn't think I'd get so heavy today, did you? Um, but um, I'm, I'm, like you mentioned, Justin Velez Hagen. I'm your moderator for this session. I'm both a veteran and an entrepreneur. Um, that quote is by, does anybody know? Okay. Thomas Paine. You mentioned the study of history, Danny. I'm, I'm an, uh, I love history, so I love to study uh, uh, the foundings of this country, especially those actors during the Revolutionary War. They were so heroic in the, in the um, um, acts they took and the statements they made were so, it seems like every word that came out of the mouth of someone back in that time period was just a, a PhD quality type of uh, research or something. Their, their, their statements were just uh, so profound and eloquent and amazing. Um, but that refrain, those who expect, expect to reap the blessings of freedom must undergo the fatigues of supporting it. Uh, it, does, it serves as a, as a common refrain for vets when they serve. It, it's inspired us since the beginning, since the Revolutionary War. It's ingrained in our psyches and it stays with us when we return and inspires us to undergo additional hardships, including launching our own businesses. In my opinion, Alva is, is, a, is a much needed intermediary now. Um, there are other organizations that are Latino focused. There are other veterans focused organizations. There's not one that fills this gap that Alva is attempting to fill here to help provide that Latino entrepreneur that comes back and wants to launch his business as well as this one is. Uh, so we're very, very, hopefully, very equipped to do so today. <clears throat> Let me give you some context on the need from my recently published um, research project by the Institute for Veterans and Military Families. This came out of um, Syracuse University. It was just published just a few months ago. It notes some of the facts that are really interesting to this specific group that we're, that we're discussing today. Of the two million veteran-owned businesses, these are both employer and non-employer businesses, they produce an estimated $1.2 trillion in revenue and approximately employ 5.2 million employees. They have about $232 billion in payroll. Of those businesses, only 7% are Hispanic and Latino veteran-owned businesses. But they do have an esti estimated $28.2 billion in revenue and employ nearly 150,000 employees have about six billion dollars in annual revenue. So they're a little underrepresented, but they produce. In fact, what's to me especially interesting is that nearly half of those social Latino entrepreneurs, which I call them, um, are social entrepreneurs. They're these that those that develop products and services that create solutions to social, cultural, and environmental issues. Whereas only 30% of white non-Hispanic entrepreneurs do the same. Eighty-seven percent of these Latino entrepreneurs consider themselves successful, so they're doing well, they're employing people, they're providing incomes, they're growing. Eighty-one percent expect sales to double in five years compared to sixty percent of non-Hispanic white uh, veteran-owned firms. So they're, they're, again, doing well. But the problem is no one else thinks that they deserve to do well or thinks that they can produce the way that they, that they do. The credit and financing standards are not, not as strong as they should be for this particular group. There aren't as many opportunities. In one instance, 58% feel that there is not sufficient equity funding, as investors mostly, uh, available for businesses compared to 40% for their white peers. 27% were denied credit financing from lenders or creditors compared to 10% of their white peers. And 33% of these entrepreneurs had an interest rate of 15% or higher on their uh, largest loans compared to 15% of their non-Hispanic white peers. So it's not a fair playing field, but it should be. And that's why we're here. We're hoping to uh, improve those standards and level the playing field a bit. A lot, of the, a lot of those stats really touched my background. I, um, Danny mentioned I founded the National Puerto Rican Chamber of Commerce and we've uh, helped hundreds of businesses at this point to uh, start, grow, successfully expand their borders beyond just the, not just the island in, in Puerto Rico, but to the mainland and across borders in different countries across the world. It's, it's been amazing to watch. Um, I'm also an economist by training, hence the doctoral designation. Um, that's kind of my passion is economic policy. I uh, work to uh, advise different corporate entities on economic policies that are beneficial to them, as well as uh, governors, uh, couple of governors across the country as well. 
but uh, probably most relevant is I'm a, I'm a business owner. Um, I, I do run a, a consulting firm, but I also uh, run a, uh, uh, an investment fund and invest in very small businesses um, with the local community. Um, so I've got my hand on a lot of different entrepreneurial ventures and a lot of different entrepreneurs, and I see what's happening in this ecosystem. I see the need. This is filling a need, so I'm excited to, excited to begin to be here. I want to take a quick opportunity to introduce um, each of our panelists here today. Um, this is a pretty esteemed panel. You're very fortunate to be here. If you don't know or you aren't familiar or haven't been introduced to these panelists, um, you're, you're in for a bit of a treat. Marie Robles, nice to, nice to be here with you. She is an accounting and finance executive with a CPA and an MBA, right? Um, she has financial expertise that spans over 20 years in both the private and public sectors. She was formerly the CFO of the Transportation Credit Union, as well as the VP of Accounting and Finance at the Northwest Federal Credit Union. And that's just the tail end of her lengthy financial career. She's a wealth of financial knowledge, to say the least. Welcome, Marie. Ruben Riley, so I feel like we should skip over you. You've already yeah. been up here. <laughs> now, I'm going to talk about you a little bit anyway, because I think it's important to touch on your background. Um, he does currently serve as the Senior VP of External Engagement, Diverse Segments, Representation, and Inclusion at Wells Fargo. That's a mouthful. Can you turn that down a little bit next time? Yeah. <laughs> and you've worked there for about four years under that role, Curtis. Um, but he has quite the diverse background. I think his title kind of encapsulates that a bit. Um, it's, it's really interesting, in fact. He's, he's worked as a former White House Deputy Assistant to the President, Director of White House Intergovernmental Affairs. He was also an elected official. Many people are aware of that. And the chief executive of several nonprofits and business advocacy organizations. So his career legitima legitimately reflects that of a sincere and avid supporter of diversity. Um, excellent to have you. <laughs> Let's give him a call. <laughs> Lee Swin, good to see you, sir. He is the marketing outreach team supervisor at the Washington Metropolitan Area District Office of the USSPA. He's got some stuff for entrepreneurs. As part of that position, he is the primary point of contact for all external comms and special events associated with promoting business counseling, training, and entrepreneurial support programs. Can't ask for a better resource than that today. In addition, Lebo cultivates close working relationships with SBA's portfolio of preferred lenders in the Washington metro area. Show us the money, Lebo. <laughs> <laughs> he has an MBA from GW. I attended there a year, actually, so good, good for you. Great. Um, but perhaps most importantly, Lebo is a veteran of the U.S. Marine Corps. Rock, rock. There you go. There's a couple of Marines in here today. <laughs> it, is, it is funny. There's a, there's a big distinction between Marines and anyone who served in another branch. If you're in the Air Force, I was in the Air Force, I say, I was in the Air Force. If you're in the Army, you say, I was in the Army. If you're a Marine, what do you say? I am a Marine. Always a Marine, right? Anyway, love it. Love it, Lebo. Thanks for your service. So I want to, just, to start this discussion, um, before we do begin, I want to be, if it's possible and if you're interested, you're welcome to raise your hand, interject, ask for us, uh, a follow-up question or offer your own advice. We have some strong experts in the crowd, so feel free to do that. Um, but I want to start this um, round discussion. I'll probably ask each of you a question and maybe come back through and ask another question. Um, feel free to um, um, answer someone else's questions if you have a certain level of expertise in that particular area as well. And then uh, um, we'll, just, we'll just keep it flowing from there. But Maria, I did want to start with you, if that's all right. You have, let's see. So given that we're focused on entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs tend to think they can do anything, especially veteran entrepreneurs. We come from what we've served, whether over, overseas or close at home, we put up with a lot, um, and we think there's nothing that can stop us. But after working in finance for many years, you've probably seen that uh, finance is hard. <laughs> uh, I commend anyone who's spent so much time in it. Um, you worked in banking and elsewhere, and you've probably seen a lot of pitfalls that this business owners fall into. Um, so what pitfalls did, have you seen, if you can name a couple? Have you seen uh, new business owners fall into, or even seasoned entrepreneurs, some that they've fallen into in regards to their business finance in particular? So I'd say, obviously, when you're starting a business, you're an expert in what you're starting your business in, right? But you may not be an expert in some of the other aspects. And 
finances is one of the aspects that a lot of entrepreneurs might not have that expertise in. And so just making sure that you're reaching out to folks that know that area and that can help guide you in terms of the business structure, the taxes, uh, the tax implications of the business, and the insurance implications of the business, that's really key. Um, budgeting is another thing that is really important, making sure you have a, a good budget um, in place. And so finding someone that can help you with that is, I think, really important and, and can be key in whether your business is successful or not. And before your career in corporate finance, did you, did you work individually as a CPA advising other small businesses? I'm, I'm just curious. Yes, I did work in public accounting for quite a bit and a lot of our clients were small businesses and they needed help, like I said, with their finances, their budgets, implementing accounting systems, helping uh, uh, organize all of their, their finances, putting it into their accounting system, so that kind of thing. All of that requires a lot of time and expertise that you might not have because you're trying to focus on what your business is about, right? So. Uh, and, and I want to go back to your most recent position as, as CFO, if you don't mind me digging in a little bit, because I, I found it really interesting, uh, um, someone who serves as a financial officer um, within a bank. So the bank is all about finance, but then you're kind of the chief financial officer. Could you, could you kind of explain your role a little bit more in that organization and how that... So as a chief financial officer, um, you're focused on strategy, right? So specifically in the credit union and, and banking industries, it's mainly about managing your net interest margin, right? Because you're earning interest on the loans and you're paying out interest on the deposit accounts you have. So really it's about managing the risk and, and really finding that fine balance of you know, how much are we going to be lending out and the rates we're going to be you know providing on what we're lending out versus the rates we're going to provide on the deposits um, and so so it's a lot about you know thinking very strategically um, about all the, the balance you know the, the asset liability management of the balance sheet any financial questions you have an expert here get some free advice while you can um, I'm going to shift over to um, Ruben, and I might be asking you for some free advice there too. You don't mind. Every penny. <laughs> That's right. Let's switch over there to um, to Ruben. Um, could you first maybe expand upon your current role in Wells Fargo, and maybe a little bit about your background in the organization, how it's how it's gotten you to the point where you are today? Uh, sure. So um, as you mentioned, I haven't been at Wells very long. Um, I uh, mainly have been focused on uh, political and uh, civic nonprofit. Uh, efforts mainly in the Latino community uh, across the country um, and um, Wells Fargo many might know had some issues uh, some serious issues uh, in the, around the 2016 2017 time period and um, so and I've not been in the military I've not been a marine but um, when you see something's on fire I don't know why I ran into it um, because it, to me Wells Fargo is such an incredible brand especially for folks uh, like me who have come from California out west where the brand is really strong. Um, knowing that, um, that the, the organization, um, there was a lot there to salvage, if you will. Um, I was part of a group that came in um, now about three years ago um, to uh, you know, try to change it, turn it around. And it is a, it is a, it's a big, big company with multiple lines of business. Um, and we've got, I think at this point, some fantastic leadership that's focused on, um, on making sure that we correct um, some of the um, inadequacies or some of the challenges that, that the com this conglomerate of different businesses really had to deal with. Um, and um, not, it's not only on the business side, but on the regulatory side here, especially in DC, you know, there are a lot of, uh, uh, there's plenty of oversight and, uh, and help provided in terms of how to run, run the um, so long story short, I started in the government relations uh, area, but then um, because of what's happened in the last two years in, in our country uh, with a focus on uh, diversity and, and inclusion, I uh, was part of a, a group, um, that, a new group that formed within Wells in the last couple of years, focused exclusively on uh, diversity and inclusion. And uh, my role at this point is to work with external partners, 
uh, mainly national organizations like like that we're trying to build up ALBA to be um, and to, to really focus on um, those partners, external organizations that can help us with this whole issue of diversity and inclusion, understanding the demographics of the country are changing and that um, our, our employees, our customers and the communities we serve are becoming more diverse every day. And so my focus is on how do we better serve those customers those communities um, and then how do we you know in the bottom line how do we get more of that diverse uh, potential clientele to become Wells Fargo clients right and it's with an understanding of, of the diversity of those of those customers and potential clients uh, that we hopefully serve them better I, I would imagine that <clears throat> within that realm you're, you're, you're deeply focused on developing entrepreneurship or increasing opportunities because that uh, obviously increases new uh, potential Definitely. Uh, partners oh, yeah. and or, a big part customers for yours. Yeah, big part. And we can get in more into more specifics, but uh, we spend a lot of time and energy and money mm -hmm. focused on a diverse small business. Um, and so, if you know, with the PPP program, um, uh, Greg might know better than I, or others might know better than I. But if we weren't the uh, bank with the most loans to diverse small businesses, I'm, I'm not sure which was. If we weren't the bank with the lowest uh, average loan amounts I'm not sure which bank was um, so in other words we got loans out more loans out to uh, smaller loans to smaller diverse businesses because most diverse businesses tend to be smaller and uh, we, we had a real focus on that it, it's not as easy as it might sound because of some of the regulatory barriers you can't you know you're all kind of blind in terms of um, who you're giving the money to in terms of um, diversity and equity um, and inclusion metrics uh, on the you know Part of it, you can't you can't collect some of that data, um, but uh, we were able to kind of figure out where are the diverse small businesses, where are those entrepreneurs, and how can we get the, the dollars out to them. And then um, then we took, and many people might not understand or know that with the PPP program, uh, the everyone, the Paycheck Protection Program, you know, multi-billion-dollar program. Well, banks that participated got received fees for participating. Um, and our CEO, Charlie, who I, he, I, um, if I haven't said enough in terms of how incredible I think he is, his first mandate to us when, when PPP started was, we will not collect a single penny of PPP um, uh, fees from the government. Anything we collect, including our expenses, all goes back out to small, diverse small businesses. So we ended up collecting $400 million from our participation in the PPP program. And Every single one of those dollars went out to either CDFIs to give to diverse small businesses, uh, to uh, nonprofits and other business organizations to help with technical assistance. And now we're spending about just over $100 million of what's left into uh, a program that we have focused on uh, five different communities across the country, uh, $20 million each to try to see if we can affect um, how each one of them helps to, to create an infrastructure for small and diverse businesses. Fascinating. When we, um, when, when some of us at the chamber were working with businesses during the uh, during the whole recent crisis uh, and the COVID lockdowns, working through the possible channels and opportunities to to achieve or receive PVP funds, um, Wells Fargo was generally one of the easiest banks to work with. Um, a lot of our uh, members were asking about how to work with you guys, how to work through that process, um, just because they had heard that it was an easier one to navigate. Um, so kudos to, to you guys for having an impact on our Puerto Rican community too. Um, within within your bank, I, I know you come across a lot of, uh, like I said, entrepreneurs and, and, and different uh, small business investors. Um, they face a lot of challenges. Are there are there certain barriers within banking that you have seen um, that entrepreneurs may, may may face that can be surmountable that maybe aren't seen as as such. As easy obstacles to overcome um, that Wells Fargo or yourself are aware of that can, you can potentially help with. Well, I have a, a, a kind of a bias in that regard. So my um, my parents uh, came from Mexico, so so they were immigrants here, manual laborers. They need to call, you know school, you know high school. Um, so they were manual laborers, and my dad eventually started a small roofing company. You know, which you know our our national headquarters was our garage, right? And we you know we put roofs on houses and. Uh, and my mom was cleaning houses. She actually cleaned houses of some of my schoolmates, which um, 
which I say was like for me the most embarrassing and the thing that filled me with the most pride because like you know the other kids would say oh your mom my mom says your mom is the best house cleaner we've ever had so you know like as a kid you're so embarrassed and again so proud at the same time but um, and then she eventually opened up a small coffee shop a couple blocks away from our house so my parents were small business people I mean they you know they had their own businesses and we were, I was roofing or cleaning dishes and you know in weekends or summers and then in the evenings you know doing the books right um, but I never really had an appreciation for it until you know now that I'm working at Wells Fargo there is such a difference between a small business owner and an entrepreneur. My parents were small business owners, and they, you know, they were basically self-employed, right? I mean, they were working hard every day, making a living, um, and that's what they did. Versus an entrepreneur, which I'm seeing, I'm excited about Latino entrepreneurs I'm seeing across the country. Small business owners who are thinking about how do I grow my company, thinking about you know. So and so for me, that's probably uh, you know the biggest barrier for a lot of Latino small business owners or business owners is being out of the mindset of being I own as business versus I'm growing an enterprise right being an entrepreneur um, so with that said yeah there are a lot of barriers <laughs> um, one of the you know for folks that are starting something new obviously a bank looks at you and says well let's see you know let's look at your personal finances and all versus if you, you already established something and then your business can speak for itself. So a lot of the systemic issues, uh, racism and bias against you know, minority communities, they're there in the banking system as, as much as they are in just general society. Mm -hmm. You mentioned, um, I think it's fascinating that distinction between small business ownership and entrepreneurship, and I, I can't agree with you more. Um, specific uh, to the Hispanic community, within this study that I mentioned in Syracuse, they note how in one of these surveys, I think 50% of Hispanic entrepreneurs um, just wanted to own a business that would help to provide them a job, whereas 35% of white non-Hispanic thought so. And those, the percentage of those who wanted to grow uh, something to a substantially larger business was something like 20%, mm -hmm. whereas amongst white non-Hispanic populations, it was it was closer to 80%. Uh, so it's kind of a mindset shift that I think that we need to also undergo to, to, to see that those opportunities are there doesn't have to just be a job. Your small business shouldn't just be your job. It can be something you can grow into a uh, family legacy. Um, right. I think once you shift that mindset, you start to see the opportunities. Um, right. my, my two cents. Um, Lebo, I wanted to switch over to you quickly. Um, not quickly, I hope you have good things to say. Um, but you have immense experience in the SBA. How long have you been at, the, at your current role? 10 years. 10 years? At the Washington Bureau or within the SPA? Uh, this is the same office. No? Okay. Right here. Oh, excellent. Um, there are a ton of resources at the SBA, of course. Um, but I wanted to ask you, in your opinion, what are kind of the most valuable uh, for this audience, for the Latino veteran entrepreneur? Um, which ones do you think may be most applicable and most, most usable uh, for this group? So I want to ask the audience, uh, by show of hands, how many of you have heard of SBA before today? So most of you have heard of SBA, so that's great. And uh, SBA was formed in 1959, uh, 53, I mean, so 69 years. Uh, come next year, we'll, we'll be in Rome for 70 years, and we have 68 district offices across the country. So if you're not from this area, you can find an SBA in your state, at least one SBA in your state. So there's a uh, SBA presence across the country. And local SBA office, like myself, we work with local resource partners, a network of resource partners. Those resource partners including uh, SCORE, Veteran Business Outreach Center, Women Business Center, Small Business Development Center, and they are the local resource that you should seek out to. Why? Because, as you know, business are local. There may be licensing requirement, there may be tax, case, uh, tax code requirements, so, you want to work with local resource, and SBA work with those local resource, and you know refer you to the right uh, uh, counselors or mentors, and all those are free. So if we haven't done in a good enough job to get this message out, and you know that's like a part of us. So this is the biggest benefit: is free counseling, free training, free, free mentoring to everybody. So going back to the idea I mentioned before, I, I asked. Uh, I'm going to read the initial question. Is, is entrepreneurs tend to have 
a personality they tend to think they can do it all on their own um, could you kind of delve into the, the value of say work with a sport how that works out and and whether that's for someone just you know a young person coming out of school starting a business or, or or how that could help someone who's even a seasoned entrepreneur or business owner right so the school mentors are volunteers and the, the makeup of the those volunteers are usually former business owner, current business owner, practitioners of, uh, you know, accounting, lawyer, or professors, and some are, some may have done the business that you're trying to do, you're trying to start, so they have this experience, practical experience, and they, not, they, not only they offer virtual or uh, in-person, uh, you can also go to their website and search score based on industry and background, and you can have this virtual one-on-one uh, -on -one relationship uh, with a mentor across the country, so it could be uh, you know uh, somebody that you can connect with because of your background, your language, or the industry you're trying to start to get into. So score is really one of the best secret uh, of SBA uh, training. Yeah. And they connect you. Their intention is to connect you with someone that's either similar background or from similar expertise or business or uh, industry that you're intending to invest in or investigate, right? It's not just that's anybody. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, um, and that's an incredibly valuable group, and, and it, you're so right, there's so many SBA local directors that I've spoken with that say, I don't know why people, everyone isn't on here, it's so amazing, and the people I've talked to, I've had a score mentor, I, I find it so incredibly valuable because they not just provide free coaching, but they expand your network, and everything is about networking, whether it's acquiring new customers, acquiring new skills, where uh, seeking other opportunities, seeking a new job, you got to have a network, and this is just free networking amongst a peer group that you probably don't have access to otherwise. Um, there's yeah. I want to add that uh, some of the local mentors in the DC chapter are like a, uh, with a specialized experience. You know, if you're looking to start a, uh, a brick and mortar type of business, you need to negotiate leasing, and we have a commercial landlord, we have commercial leasing experience in. You know, the mentor can help you negotiate the best lease, you know, so you don't have to go out there and risk or even maybe uh, find an attorney because some of the mentors are very experienced with this. That's, in, in my other firm, in my investment fund, we, we have um, one business that invests in healthcare clinics and we're acquiring some leases across Northern Virginia. Commercial leasing is, is not like negotiating your apartment rent. <laughs> this is, this is a, a different ball game. Um, and landlords have the upper hand, and they don't care if they screw you over. <laughs> um, so it's good to have someone in your back pocket. Uh, legal counsel is helpful too, but uh, a score mentor is probably even more valuable because they can advocate on your behalf because they have as their full incentive is to help you. Um, um, but it's a that's yeah, a it's a big. There's another organization called it's not score entrepreneurship related, but I brought it up because. There's one gentleman in here, another Marine, who was mentioning um, um, his, uh, his military career coming to an end um, soon and looking to kind of expand his networks. Um, there's an organization called American Corporate Partners. And I'm not sure, uh, has anybody heard of this organization? Yeah. Um, so they do the same, it's very similar to SCORE, except it's more about networking your career development. They do some small business development as well, if needed. Um, and they pair you up with some amazing people. Um, a couple of years ago, I was paired up with somebody who was the, um, it was JP Morgan's, some kind of, he was in the C-suite, and it's like he wouldn't even list his name until he, he met with you because he had to be that secretive about his position. But once I got to speak with him, I said, wow, I, it, I would never have access to this type of individual if I didn't reach out to this networking group like this. So it's, it's incredibly valuable to do that. American Corporate Partners, you know what I'm talking about there. Um, have you heard of them before? I hired Harold. Yeah. Okay, great, great. Um, Marie, going back to um, going back to finance, when you're when you're when you're starting off, um, financial planning is, is so difficult to prepare for. You don't know where your business is going to go. You have no idea. But you have to plan anyway. Um, and everybody has to incorporate that into some sort of business plan. If you want to get any loans or investments, you have to have a, a robust business plan that has a well-developed section on um, your financials, your expected performance, et cetera. Um, what recommendations would you give to someone who needs to develop their plan? 
um, or maybe it's kind of overlooking that and thinks it's not so important because maybe they're bootstrapping. Um, is, it, is it valuable to, to really build that out well from the beginning? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, not just from the perspective of you know helping you think about where you want to take your business, but also, like you mentioned, from the perspective of trying to find funding, right? If you need funding, if you're going to go to banks or you know wherever to get funding, they're going to ask for a business plan. They're going to want to see, like, what do you expect this business to do? What do you, what are you expecting? You know, the growth of the business to be over the next few years. So it's really key to have a good business plan put together before you go. And I don't what I think the SBA has some resources to help develop that, but it, is that something you're aware of as well, Marie? Or oh, yeah, for, for sure. That's like our bread and butter, the, the score that SBDC. And if you Google business plan on, on the internet, you see a lot of different templates. But you know, you go talk to a person, they will walk, you, walk through the, the every step that you need to be uh, fulfilled in your business plan. And the score has their template. And you can go to the SCORE website, the SBDC as well, so they can help you with that process. And, uh, and another resource that I want to mention is uh, Veteran Business Outreach Center, the VBOP. Uh, they all do the same thing with the SCORE, like, with the, like the SCORE, the WDC, you know, uh, the uh, Small Business Development Center, but they have more knowledge about the benefit to the veterans. There may be benefit from VA, there may be benefit on the state level, so you can also ch check, if you're trying to start a business, there may be specific benefit to the veteran in your state, so you can also check with the VBOC. And locally, we do have a VBOC here uh, in uh, College Park. So if you're from here, this area, and we have a VBOC in College Park. So forgive me if I, I, I didn't, if you said this and I didn't hear it, but what do they do specifically for veterans that makes them distinct from the other Right. So, research. so they uh, they work with uh, DOD, uh, VA on on their agency specific program that's like maybe beneficial or advantage to the veteran owned business. Or, uh, so they have more of those in that knowledge as well as the, the state programs. So I, I don't know the specifics, but this that will be the direction I point the veteran to go to. Yeah, you mentioned the, the planning aspect, and, and those of us who have been through, say, any type of even undergraduate business uh, business programs or a master's degree in, in business, you can kind of go through this training of how to develop a business plan, and they give you these specifics and these guides, and they say, you develop this out well, and this and this and this. For whatever reason, once people get into the real world, they kind of forget all that and just put together what they think a, a banker or an investor wants to see, and they bring it to them, and then the investor says, what is this? Why, don't, why haven't you developed this out more? I've been amazed at how many investors have looked at my, what I think are incredibly amateur business plan, just kind of following the model that I learned in, in graduate school or, 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 or in, a, in a business program. I think this is so simple to do, but I'm doing it, and it seems like they're going to reject it because I'm an amateur and I clearly don't look like it. And they look at it and they say, wow, this is really robust. You really you know, developed it out in every area that we want to look at. Um, so, so follow those plans, those uh, 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 services that are offered. I, I think they're they're very valuable for for acquiring any kind of any kind of financing or investment. Um, maybe going back to the finances again. I'm, I'm, I love finance as well, but it's also a thorn in my side because I've had um, um, and seen a number of businesses who just kind of let go of the reins of their books. Uh, forget how to maybe manage it well, um, or they say, hey, nobody's looking at it but me, who cares? Um, I'm just looking at the bottom line of my bank account and that's all that really matters, right? Um, how important is it? Is it from the get-go or even uh, for a seasoned uh, small business owner to, to really get that under control? And if it's out of control, how can they, what resources do you think uh, you would suggest to kind of bring that back in? Um, so yeah, like you said, looking at the how much you cash you have in the bank is just one piece of it right because cash flow is one thing but your uh, results and your um, your earnings each year and over each period um, is a different story right and that's what's going to really tell you whether you're making money or not it's not the cash in the bank it's not just the cash in the bank um, 
So really getting that under control, like you said, is critical. Um, and so finding the resources, you know, your SBA, people you know that are, that are strong in that area that can help you, ask for help, you know, because that is really going to, could be the determining factor of whether your business is successful or not. Lebo, are there your... Are you aware of resources within SPA that offer kind of accounting or bookkeeping? Yeah. Those sorts of things. Yeah, a lot of our resource partner has a different template. The Excel spreadsheet for um, a startup cost or cash flow projection. So you can go through this exercise with our resource partner. It's really at no cost. You're not wasting or spending any mo a penny uh, before you even start a business. And uh, once this makes sense to you on paper, you know, then you probably only then you should talk to you know a banker because you know you want to make the best impression, the best foot forward. So you really want to use those resources. Ren, the um, going back to capital and, and, and fundraising, um, entrepreneurs, especially those from diverse backgrounds, uh, with limited initial capital, at least uh, money in their own pockets, starting up. We all tend to assume that there are few opportunities for us to pursue traditional capital or traditional bank. Is, is, do you see that as being truthful? Are there opportunities within, say, a Wells Fargo-sized uh, institution that is a more uh, developed than we assume? Um, yeah, yeah, yes and no. Um, so it is hard, if you, especially if you're starting off a new enterprise, to go to a bank uh, like Wells Fargo or any of the other large banks. <coughs> It's hard, <coughs> excuse me, I get so choked up about this. <coughs> um, to, um, it, because again, they look at you as the, the person, the individual, what you have, what you have in your bank account. Um, <coughs> and many times folks don't have the kind of capital that, uh, that would justify the risk a bank would have to take. So <coughs> I want to um, make sure that people, I'm assuming people are familiar with CDFIs here, that's uh, community development finance institutions. So these are uh, local um, financial institutions that can that provide smaller loans, smaller average loans uh, <clears throat> to more diverse small businesses. So we're a big proponent of that. As a matter of fact, um, we have a site. I just have to. I wrote it down. Now I got to remember. It's called uh, BizResourceNavigator.com. So this is uh, through Wells Fargo. Business uh, BizResourceNavigator.com to help um, small business people um, who are looking for financing, who might not qualify for a traditional bank loan, to, um, to identify, they answer a few questions, and then um, based on your, whatever location you're at, uh, we'll identify some CDFI institutions that are more inclined to give smaller scale loans to small startups, small businesses. Um, one of the challenges with CDFIs is they're required by law uh, uh, to have collateral, you have to have some kind of collateral, um, but uh, but they do provide a, a real alternative for folks that need uh, financing. And so, uh, as I mentioned, with our um, Open for Business Fund, we gave we've given hundreds of millions of dollars to CDFIs around the country, so they can provide more loans to small uh, businesses. I also want to make a plug for one organization folks may or may not have heard of, LBAN. I don't know if folks here are familiar with LBAN. It's the Latino Business Action Network. LBAN, <clears throat> they partner with Stanford Graduate School of Business, and they do a cohort every year of Latino small businesses. Um, their whole purpose in life is to help Latino small businesses grow. So if you apply and get selected into their cohort for the year, then um, you, you basically get a graduate education at Stanford in, in terms of you know um, uh, growing your business. Um, so I, would, I really encourage folks to look at it, and you may or may not be at a level where you're you know, able to participate in that, but um, you, 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 are, you... Cohort two. Yeah, what's that? Cohort number two. Cohort number two right here. So she, she can tell you more about yeah, it. Yeah, cohort 12 or 13 now. Yeah, so it's a, a, I think it's great because I, I think it's really going to become the network of, of, of Latino entrepreneurs around the country. Um, so I'm really excited about it. So look into LBAN um, for those who are, who are business people and, and your vote of support for that, Jackie? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And I found it fascinating when I was looking at your background, Ruben, that you were also the CEO of the San Diego Regional Chamber of Commerce for seven years. Um, and your tenure 
straddled the great financial crisis, which probably wasn't too easy to manage through seeing all the businesses that you worked with suffer to some degree yeah. or another. Um, in fact, everybody did. Um, are, there, are there any lessons from that small business experience, uh, or maybe even your, your general background, now that we know a little bit more about your, your history, um, that you would offer to a, a small business operator who is looking at the potential recession on the horizon? Yeah, um, so yeah, San, that was a tough time in San Diego because of the housing market in San Diego, obviously, obviously like a number of different markets, but took a significant hit. And it, it, you know, it did impact a lot of, the, well, a lot of this is large and small, obviously. And so I guess the lesson there is a lesson kind of keep learning over and over again, what you refer to that network. Um, for small business people, they're not experts in law and accounting and taxes. You, um, it's really vital, like I think maybe just in life, to expand your network so that you have, you know, a banker, a lawyer, an accountant, folks that you can tap into um, uh, for advice, um, ongoing advice. One of the things I, I'm not a real banker; I just play one on panels. But um, you know, one of the, our real bankers talk about how they see hundreds and hundreds of business plans over the course of a year as people are coming to them for loans. So you know, so your banker can be a, a resource. I mean, they're not going to give you know tell you how to run your company. But you know, you show them your numbers and your projections and your plan. They might be able to give you some perspective on you know um, on, on how things are looking or um, or the like. So um, you know, tap into and, and again and, and again relearn the lesson of PPP during the you know during that period. Um, the the businesses that got loans uh, generally were, were well were the ones that had a relationship with a bank. Um, so you know, developing networking. This is a good thing to. Um, you know, make those connections uh, when you need them. And, and every indication is in the next few years we'll, we'll all need them. And Marie, following up on that, would you say coming from a, 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 a community bank, would you consider the banks you worked in as community banks? Or they serve they're credit unions, right? Yeah, they're credit unions. They serve the members of so, so the community. Yeah. So, so those relationships I've seen with community banks, and I'm not saying that the ones you worked in were necessarily that, where it seemed to be especially mm -hmm. strong, developed, and important uh, if not vital for acquiring any kind of loan of any size. Oh yeah, um, absolutely. That, Credit unions yeah. specifically will go out of their way to help their members, right? And so during the pandemic when the businesses were coming to the credit unions and getting the PPP loans, asking for the forgiveness on the PPP loans, and um, even on their other loans that they held at the credit union, um, the credit union worked with them and they either found ways of modifying the loan to help them out, um, sometimes even forgiving part of the loan or, or all of the loan, depending on the situation the member was in. So, you know, really working with that banker, uh, community bank, credit union, and like you said, developing that relationship can be really important. Quick story, my, my stepfather recently told me a, a story when he was building these assisted living homes. I had never heard him discuss this before, but he had an especially hard time. I think he had three different homes at one period, and I believe it was during a recession, early 2000s, and he just didn't have the funds to pay on the loans. He went to the bank, sat down, and basically said, I can't pay, here are my keys, take over the business if you want to, but I just can't pay the loans. And by going in there, discussing with them face to face, they said, oh, no, we don't want the keys. We don't want to be in this business. You know, let, let's work something out. Um, but that was a little bit of an extreme example, or uh, not something I necessarily recommend to anybody to, to, to do. But the point was, he developed that face to face personal relationship. And that meant everything to the bank and to him, and to, to see that, hey, he's a real person that's actually doing everything he can. And those are things that you can read uh, uh, only in person. Uh, yeah, absolutely. A, so, a lot you can get out of that face-to-face -face interaction, so it's, it's, a, it's really valuable. Um, and, and going back to financing a little bit, Lebo, and, and I don't know if this is up your expertise, but everybody, uh, all entrepreneurs think they want an SBA-backed loan. Um, they usually think that it's um, outside of their um, realm of possibilities, given certain standards that are required. Um, but is it impossible for a, a new business to get an SBA loan, or are you, are you familiar with so this is very much my, my expertise. I did have some uh, banking experience in the community bank, but I know that, that uh, the banks by nature are very uh, risk averse. So uh, SBA loan is 
is eligible use for a startup business. But just because SBA loan can be used for startup business and can be based on cash flow projection, the banks operate on uh, cash flow, past performance. So if you're a startup business, um, pretty much SBA 7A loan and 504 loan are, you know, you can use, you can apply, but the banks are the ones that are making the decision are probably not going to see you as bankable. So we do have other products to help small business uh, getting SBA loan. So uh, the 7A loan, if you're familiar with a VA home loan for the veterans, it's the same same thing. It's the money come from the, the bank, not from SBA, but SBA guarantee the bank or the lender in case of loan default. Only in the worst case scenario, SBA is involved. The SBA 7A and 504 is the same concept. Um, so for startup business, you know, you're pretty much not bankable for those products. And SBA offers the micro loan and community adventure. So the micro loan is uh, up to fifty thousand dollars, five year or less, and it's ideal for startup business. And you work with micro lenders. Some of the micro lenders are non for profit business or CDFI lenders, and uh, uh, they, you know, because they're taking higher risk, the interest rate may be higher. And they, but they also provide technical assistance. They help you with this process of starting the business and make sure you're successful, because they're on the they're on the hook for this money. The money come from SBA, but the micro lender do the underwriting, do the uh, decision, and the, the set the terms and interest rate. So if you default on the loan on your business, the micro lender has to pay the money to SBA. So micro lender is another is one option. A second option is a community advantage lender. It's the same seven eight loan product, but uh, a little less uh, maximum amount. But it's also community based lender. They have easier. Um, lower standards, so to speak, to work with a uh, startup and a community-based business, kind of like CDFI lender. Would you, would you call that community advantage? Yeah, community advantage lender. They use the same 7A product, but it's not a traditional lending institution. They're more like a non-for-profit or um, like a micro lender institution. Are we done? Three minutes. Okay. Um, one way I've found entrepreneurs um, that have found opportunities to overcome kind of the, those limitations on bankability coming out of the gate is to invest in a franchise opportunity, a, a, a business system that is already developed and uh, has been proven across uh, across uh, multiple units. Um, have, have any of you worked with franchisors, being in banking or uh, SBA, and have you, have you seen the advantages play out uh, for entrepreneurs in general or specifically for veterans who tend to do well following systems? Yes, so uh, SBA loan can be used for a franchise, but the franchise must be registered on the franchiseregistry.com because, uh, or for any new franchise, you know, coming to the market, SBA need to review uh, the franchise agreement. The one that lists on the franchise registry.com, that means SBA has already reviewed and approved those kind of operation. Because any franchise operator need to be independently, has a, cert, a certain degree of independent operation for the business, not just a turnkey operation. You know, certain franchise wouldn't be eligible, eligible for SBA loan, like uh, I think 7-Eleven or a certain business practice uh, discriminative uh, hiring wouldn't be qualified, but for the most part, yes. So beyond the franchise, franchise registry, that doesn't guarantee access to loan, it's just more... More like just, eligibility, not for qualification. Gotcha. Um, we've only got a minute or two. I just wanted to provide the opportunity for each of the panelists to, to say a, a quick closing comment if you have any other advice that you'd like to close with, um, financial, related to your own background, or just in general from your experience. I'll go ahead and start with Marie. I have to put you on the spot too much. But, uh, <laughs> sure. Um, so I'm not an entrepreneur, so I asked a couple of my friends who are entrepreneurs and who I admire very much to give me a few things that they would say um, people should think about. And a few things they mentioned were research the industry you're going to do business in. If there's competitors in that industry, then that means you've got something that's viable. Um, 
Another thing is um, make sure that you find people that will um, feed your, he said, feed your mind, but I view it as feeding your soul. So there's gonna be days where it's gonna be really hard. Sometimes it can take two to three years for a business to really get going. So find those people that are really gonna encourage you and you know, motivate you and, and you know, tell you you got this during those times that are really tough. Um, and then, you know, save for a rainy day, you know, because like I said, the, there are gonna be times where maybe it's gonna be a little bit tougher and you're not gonna have the cash flow coming in. So make sure you've got a little bit of a pad. Um, and yeah. You go? Yeah. So very quickly, I brought some uh, SBA flyers and one pagers on that table at the end. So you can grab something. Uh, and then also, I talk about SBA counseling and training. I talk about SBA access to capital. SBA also offers contracting support. So if you have a product or service to sell the to sell to the federal government, SBA can help you get through this process. Sometimes you can benefit by being a veteran-owned small business or women-owned small business, and we can help you with this process. We'll talk about that on the next panel too, right? So yep. you're going to stay for that, right, Lee? Yeah. <laughs> sure. Ruben? Um, I think it's uh, the networking. You know, uh, participate. Uh, you can veteran association, uh, Latino business organizations. Um, just and find out which one works for you. They're not all going to work for you, but but there you might find. Uh, uh, the organization or the network with, around the organization might provide uh, some, some valuable connections for you to your business. Three great pieces of, of advice. Thank you all so much. Can we give a round of applause?